Hi, Susan. Um, this is Susan Nabulindo, um, and she is going been kind enough to agree to let me interview her on the uh, COVID situation in her home country. Uh, Co Susan, do you give me permission to record you for this interview? Yes, I give you permission to record. Okay, yeah. great. And um, so, first of all, if you could just state your name and what you do and how we know each other. <laughs> Good. Yeah, so I'm uh, Dr. Susan Nabulindo. I am a pediatric anesthesiologist in, uh, at the University of Nairobi, working at the Kenyatta National Hospital. Uh, I also offer critical care services in the hospital. So we have worked with Faye uh, probably for the last uh, six years on many projects and also uh, basically mainly on uh, a fellowship of pediatric anesthesia in Kenya, which has picked up very well and on many other projects surrounding uh, pediatric anesthesia in our country and in the region basically. And uh, so can you share with the folks who are listening to this interview, although they're not gonna listen to it, they're just gonna read it. Um, where are you now? And tell me a little bit about the COVID-19 situation um, in, your, in your region. Yes, so currently I'm in Nairobi. That is where I work and where I live. That is the capital city of uh, Kenya. So we, recorded our first COVID positive case on 13th of March, uh, 2020. That is about, um, <laughs> yeah, about two weeks ago. Yes, so uh, from then, then the government, the Ministry of Health, together with a task force of experts have been following the situation and there has been reporting of uh, cases increasing as per today, which is the 30th of, uh, March, we have a total of confirmed 50, 50 confirmed cases positive, and they are all in isolation and being followed up. And uh, contact tracing of all these uh, positive uh, confirmed cases have also been traced and they are being followed up. So, uh, important to note that initially, up to today, most of our cases had been. Uh, people who had traveled into the country. But uh, today we have had the first confirmation of probable community uh, infections going on, as reported by the, uh, the cabinet uh, secretary for, um, for health, as uh, the brief for today. So we are now getting into a new uh, place where now there is confirmed uh, uh, cases where there's a confirmed suspicion that there is community uh, infections going on. Okay. Yeah, so far again, uh, they are still testing people who, about a week ago, about seven days ago, all travelers who are coming from abroad, from countries, uh, basically it was a blanket, anybody coming from uh, outside the country had to self-quarantine. Initially, it was voluntary going home, but uh, it was realized people are not uh, self-quarantining. So the government put in place um, measures that everybody was to be quarantined in specific places designated by the government. So we have uh, people who came into the country self-quarantined and testing of those particular people is going on slowly at particular intervals, uh, depending on when they came in. So contacts for people, again, who have been confirmed positive have also been uh, followed up and have been put in isolation places and testing going on. Okay. Um, so we are having, uh, uh -huh. No, keep going, that's great, keep, keep going. Uh, so testing is going on, not widespread yet. It is uh, mainly for the people in quarantine and the contacts of the confirmed cases so far. Um, we have been assured that uh, uh, depending on the situation that they are monitoring, then they'll spread over the testing to a wider range depending on what is happening from their monitoring. But currently it's just uh, contacts of the people who have been tested positive and the people in quarantine who, are they, who had traveled into the country from 
mainly the countries of concern. Yeah. Okay. And have, um, of the 50 people who have contracted the disease, how many are in the hospital? Do you know? Yeah, all of them are basically isolated. So there are various uh, places where the government has said there's an isolation unit um, at one hospital where most of the patients are. Uh, we had uh, some patients, we had uh, one, uh, some patients in ICU, I cannot confirm a number, but we had two in ICU, one of uh, who is the only patient we have lost so far. He was admitted at one of the hospitals in an ICU, uh, but he didn't make it. Uh, so far, the reports have been that uh, most of the patients who have uh, been tested positive are in the isolation unit and they are quite stable. Uh, that is the information we have, yeah. And, uh, and uh, these patients, would they come most likely to Kenyatta or would they go to any of the hospitals or you just don't know? Uh, so far, the Ministry of Health has been very categorical in communicating where these patients need to be, um, need to go. So they are all, there is a, Kenyatta National Hospital has an isolation unit, which was built before because of Ebola and cholera cases. Ah, okay. So that was used as one of the isolation places. But for this COVID-19 uh, isolation unit, it was in our neighboring hospital, just next to Kenyatta Hospital, called Mbagadi uh, County Hospital. That was where the bigger isolation unit was. So, How many beds are in that isolation unit? Do you know? Uh, at the Kenyatta National Hospital, the isolation unit has six beds. And uh, in Bagadi, there were 11 beds. But they have been expanded because of the number of cases. Yeah. So there are not so many. And then uh, there is also Kenyatta University Referral Hospital, which is a big new hospital. Uh, they had, they, when the a pandemic came in, they, are just, they were just opening the hospital. So that hospital has been designated as a COVID hospital as we continue getting patients. And they have uh, up to 350 beds, which they are preparing as isolation uh, beds. Uh, for the start. And then, um, okay. So if a patient, how, I guess my question is, how do patients, um, yes. it sounds like you guys, and, and Zimbabwe is the same way as like designating these hospitals, but when patients come to the hospital because they're sick, they would just be transferred to those hospitals if it was suspected that they had COVID? Yes, now, since we, I mean, the public, edu uh, public health education started quite early uh -huh. in the year, and uh, with the Ministry of Health people going out to educate people through radio, media, SMSs through one of the big telecommunication free SMS to people. There is a number that people are expected to call. Uh -huh. ah. So people are being discouraged from coming into hospitals. If you develop symptoms that you think are uh, which have been being described in the media particular symptoms are febrile respiratory illness then you can call this number ah. don't come to the hospital call this number then you'll be directed where to go okay or be... if you're feeling unwell then there is an option of sending an ambulance to pick you instead of you uh walking into the hospital emergency departments yeah so so far in the city Nairobi, that has been working well. In the periphery, it was still lagging a bit behind. But now I think uh, as we go, as time passes, the, the, che the communication and the plans are being put down to the county levels, to the periphery, to the rural areas, yeah. Sounds so, like it's getting pretty organized. Yes, yeah, so there's a lot of uh, public uh, information going out through TV, radio, SMSs to uh people's phones through the ministry of health and the good thing is that uh phone use in kenya is quite widespread so a lot of people are able to get these messages yeah is the government doing much around social distancing yes so um the social distancing uh, advice has been going out again 
from about when we had the first case. Uh, they, uh, I mean, initially it was just advising people to social distance and describe what social distance is through the various uh, telecommunication channels. Uh -huh. um, then as the cases continued, they went ahead and now started putting measures like how many people can be carried into a, in a public service vehicle. So the public service vehicle were told to downgrade and carry only 60% of their capacity. And uh, they were asked to people wash hands and sanitize all public uh, transport vehicles should have sanitizers and people clean their hands before they get in. Uh, it has been a challenge a bit, of course, uh, people not obeying, but Again, they went up to uh, things like uh, now um, telling people supermarkets to put sanitizers in place. Supermarkets have gone to lengths of, uh, in, I mean, limiting the number of people going into the store at any particular time. So you'll find that even those who are queuing behind are told to have spaces behind. So slowly by slowly as time goes by, measures have been put in for social distancing. Our schools were closed immediately. Immediately the first case was uh, uh, diagnosed, then schools and universities closed immediately. So children are at home. And then uh, again, people were encouraged to work at home. So most of the, most people are working at home. Only essential service people are allowed to go to, uh, to work. Sounds like you guys jumped on that really fast. We were much more delayed. Yes, and then, and then about four days ago, uh, there was uh, imposition of uh, 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. curfew. So everybody's supposed to be out of the public areas by 7 p.m. Yeah, but uh, how this is supposed to work, we are not so sure. Yeah, but again, that has been put in place very strictly. So employ, employ, employers of people who are still going to work have been told to release people by 4 p.m. so that basically no public places are open at night. So this has actually decreased the people going into restaurants, into clubs. Uh, so everybody's to be at home by 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. no movement apart from the essential services, yeah. So the doctors mainly have been given passes to walk around with at night if you have to go to work at night, yeah. As an anesthesiologist in your country specifically, what concerns do you have regarding COVID-19? Um, do you feel like you're at particular risk um, in your setting, at your hospital? Yes, so as an anesthesiologist and probably talking from uh, what we have been sharing in our anesthesia group is that people are very concerned. One, because of uh, the fact that um, we have stopped elective surgeries, by the way. The elective surgeries started uh, being run, I mean, going down last uh, about two weeks ago, but right now, most of the hospitals, including private hospitals have scaled down. Very few hospitals are running elective surgeries and even those who are running elective surgeries, it's very uh, small volumes. So the concern is that uh, the anesthesiologists and maybe even other doctors are still seeing patients, these are emergency cases. Uh, patients who are coming into the hospitals um, from the community. So you might have a patient who is involved in a motor vehicle accident coming in. They're coming from the community. Testing is not widespread. So the concerns of having people who might have been exposed or who are positive coming into surgery, and you do not know because we are not testing these particular patients. Uh, there has been a struggle of trying to convince the administrators of the various hospitals that basically anesthesiologists, especially at procedures where we're having uh, intubation, aerized uh, procedures, we need to have protection. The, most of the administrators are not buying into that yet because people are still hanging on uh, the fact that the patients are not positive and ETC, but slowly by slowly, most hospitals are, are starting to agree that because now we have confirmed community spread going on, then if you are 
getting into these procedures but uh, that are high risk, then you need to probably uh, protect yourself. Whether people have uh, what to use for protection, again, depends on where they are working. So people have gone to lengths of uh, buying their own protective masks, the N95 masks people are purchasing for their own use. Um, that is not quite sustainable because as it is now in the various hospitals, the anesthesiologists and the doctors in the front line are not being given PPEs to use if cases are not confirmed. Yeah. And the other, the other concern is basically the uncertainty and uh, the fear of what is coming ahead um, with what people are watching going on in the rest of the world. You're asking yourself if we are ready really to handle a surge of patients, especially when it comes to if we were to receive a huge number of critical care, patients requiring critical care, starting from the infrastructure and mainly also human resource, people who can actually take care of uh, Care patients, which falls on anesthesia in, in our country. We are quite few. So the anxieties of if we, sh we will be able to handle that, if people, if we will reach a point where we have to decide who gets a ventilator or not. So those anxieties are what people are discussing now, uh, causing a bit of anxiety. And But specifically right now for us is a personal protection in an environment where testing is not widespread and you're still seeing patients coming from a community where there is confirmed community spread going on. Yeah. What do you think your hospital needs right now, other than PPE? Uh, so what we probably would talk about is, uh, we are at the planning level and uh, we are trying to use statistics from what we are seeing in the rest of the world. And most we are, if we assume that most of the patients we shall receive are basically not patients who might need critical care, but patients who are sick enough to, to be taken care in the hospital, we are talking about having, do we have enough oxygen supply? So most hospitals depend on the oxygen cylinders. They do not have their own oxygen plants. Uh, just one hospital, the Kenyatta University Hospital, which has been taken as one of the hospitals that will take uh, positive patients when they become many, has its own oxygen plant. But mm -hmm. most of the hospitals depend on cylinder, buying cylinders of oxygen. So that might be one thing that might run down. So we are thinking of uh, probably having a backup, like having oxygen concentrators. Mm -hmm. which do I mean, we can make oxygen from the air as we go. Yeah. And then we have questions of, do we have enough ma oxygen masks? Yeah, just the usual ah, masks. Good. masks. Yeah. Because you guys would normally reuse those a lot of times between patients. So now all of a sudden, that's a really good thing that has not come up in discussion. Yes. The, face, the oxygen face mask to give it yes. to the patient. Yes, to give it to the patient. So if we, are, we know that most of the patients will be moderate, mild to moderate disease, so we need the masks be with us. So um, discussions today with the rest of the anesthesiologists is to try and the rest of the hospitals to try and interrogate how many masks do you have? Where are we getting the supplies from? So we need to have a big number of these, which I believe most hospitals do not have. In right. Kenyatta National Hospitals, even where we, I am, sometimes we have very few of those. And uh, sometimes you have them, but you have the wrong sizes for the patients. Yeah, so those are some of the basic things that we might require the oxygen mass. Yeah. Then monitoring. Yeah. Pulse oximeters available in the OR. They are not usually available anywhere else in the hospitals apart from the ORs and the ICUs. So if we have to make beds for patients out of these particular areas, then mm -hmm. we'll probably need more monitors. Yeah. Things just like pulse oximeters because we know a main problem for these patients is oxygenation. So monitoring oxygenation is one of the key things that we have to do if we have to make beds out of ICUs and out of wards. Yeah. Yep. 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 No, I think you're absolutely right. This is great. Yeah. Yes. And then of course, just the other supplies like 
IV fluids, feeds, and but uh, people are looking also at that. Uh, and then lastly, if we get into a situation of having a lot of critically ill patients who require ICU, our number of ventilators might not be able to sustain that, but the government is uh, purchased ventilators uh, and they are promising to purchase more, but that is another area where probably <laughs> we might need uh, more support. Okay. No, that's super helpful. What about as far as, you know, other folks have talked about just sharing protocols and things like that, just so we don't reinvent the wheel? Clearly, they'll have to be adapted for the Kenyan context, but uh, yes, so sharing that is, that is experience. Of, yeah, so the, the personnel, trained personnel, again, we are low on that. We have ICU trained nurses, again, not so many, but uh, a good number. So we are trying to map out where these uh, ICU nurses are. Mm -hmm. Then we have the doctors. So again, question of anesthesiologists. Uh, we are now maybe about 200, a group, another group graduated just recently. So about 200 of uh, anesthesiologists scattered all over the place. Uh, we have a few of our other colleagues in other specialties who do critical care, internal medicine, people, pediatrics. Mm -hmm. And then now we have the medical officers. We have some medical officers who have been working in ICUs for a long time. And then there are clinical officers who are anesthesia who mm -hmm. might be helpful in that and the nurses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, the struggle has been that information has been very fragmented and people are receiving so much information from social media. So having a channel where you have information tailored to people who will take care of patients with protocols, information that has been authenticated, what people are using and what is successful and sharing it uh, will be very, very important here. Yeah. No, I think, Susan, that's, I think the, the amount of material, you know, we're hoping that people will have places that at least even healthcare workers where they can go grab their materials. I mean, we have the CDC, the WHO and things like that. But as far as anesthesia specific resources, I'm hoping the WFSA will have a lot. Um, and then some, some national societies have an ASA, AAGBI, and then also um, the APSF. There's an article I'll share with you when we get off that's just about to come out, the one that Lewis is on that has a bunch of really good resources. And I think the key is, is just to not get overwhelmed by the resources and find one that, a site that's got the stuff that's relevant to you or ask, ask your colleagues. Yeah. Um, so as you face the COVID-19 outbreak in your country, what, what do you as Susan Nabulinda fear most? <laughs> Yeah, so personally, uh, the fear is uh, basically the point at which you have a surge of patients and knowing uh, how our health system is currently, my fear is that a lot of people might get infected and die out in the rural area without ever reaching hospital. And they might not even be counted as part of the statistics of deaths uh, from COVID-19. Yeah, so that is uh, my fear in that the, even much early if we get a surge, we'll have a lot of people who we might lose back in the, uh, in the rural areas because of the way the health system is right now. Yeah. What gives you the most hope? Like what makes you think, hey, it's going to be okay? <laughs> what gives me the most hope is that we probably have been lucky to be at the tail end of receiving this body. So we are learning from others who have done it. And the others who have done it are probably the high resourced uh, societies. So if we basically take lessons from the high resourced uh, settings who have been overwhelmed and they are telling us these are the few things that worked well. If we put those things in place, then probably we can um, be able to handle the situation when it comes to us. Yeah, so that is what gives me hope, yeah, that we have a bit of time to talk and plan and convince the 
the population that uh, doing some public health things might actually make the situation better for us. And also the fact that the government, the Ministry of Health is uh, taking this very seriously and putting measures in place as they receive the information uh, is also something uh, that gives me hope that probably because we are learning from people as we see things uh, unfold, we shall put measures in place and uh, be able to dodge some bullets uh, compared to if we were all in the dark and we are receiving this as without any experience from anybody else yeah no thank you thank you thank you that was um i'm going to stop the recording now but that was that was amazing um <laughs> hold on let me just uh